Good evening, and welcome to Lawyers on the Line. I'm Bob Falsani, founding partner at Falsani, Balmer, Peterson, Quinn, and Beyer Law Firm, and I'm the moderator this evening. Tonight we're talking about criminal law. The criminal courts rely on the work of judges, lawyers, and numerous other players in making sure defendants and victims are treated fairly while balancing the interests of society at large. Here to talk about the criminal court system and answer your questions are tonight's panelists. The famous Judge John DeSanto, he's a retired district court judge, former chief prosecutor for St. Louis County, uh, and of course he's fairly famous for the Congan murder thing. Dan Liu, chief public defender for the 6th Judicial District, and Victoria Wanta, a St. Louis County attorney uh, prosecutor. So we want you to call in with your questions locally, and here's the number, 218-788-2844. And if that's long distance for you, you can call our toll-free line at 1-877-307-8762. And now on to our show. Now, let's say uh, the case has gone to trial, somebody's been convicted, or there's a plea bargain and it's time for sentencing, or a sentencing's approaching. What can a person do to enhance their chances at sentencing to be treated less severely? Anything? I think there's a lot you can do. Uh, first and foremost, work with your attorney. Uh, you've got good attorney, work with your attorney. Second, begin identifying what brought you to court. Was there some underlying reason? Was it chemicals? Was it some mental health concerns? Begin addressing them with the provider. Yes, find some supporters in the community that will write on your behalf, that will stand up with you, and begin restoring yourself. Uh, be thinking about uh, how you will make amends for any injury or harm you've caused that brought you to sentencing. Now, Judge DeSanto, um, your career started, bef I think, before the sentencing guidelines, right? It did. Okay. It did. Do the sentencing guidelines sort of limit a judge's ability to show mercy in the right case or to take into account pre-sentence type things? You know, uh, they're designed to be fair to everyone so that everyone who's convicted of a similar crime, of the same crime under similar circumstances with the same criminal history uh, score or th prior crimes uh, or convictions is treated fairly. But there is, is still leeway within the guidelines to, uh, for a judge with the proper uh, motions uh, before it to uh, depart downward or upward uh, based on, and now that is actually a jury question as well, if the, if the matter is a criminal case. Oh, so the departures uh, the can go to a jury too? The factors that become the aggravating factors uh, for uh, allowing a judge to depart have to be proven now beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, and that's, that's sort of... Or waived and, uh, if you're going to go right to sentencing and agreed that they are present. I see. So... Um, Prosecutors have some input into this whole process of what sentence is going to be through the plea bargaining process? Yes. Okay. And so do people get out in front sometimes and say, okay, you know, I've done this and this and this already, um, you know, cut me some slack? Um, well, there's always a negotiation process that goes on between the prosecutor and the defense attorney um, before the case goes to trial. And a lot of the time the defense attorneys will come at you with a packet of information saying, you know, here's what my guy has done, you know, can we work something out? And so there is a long negotiation process that goes on to see if there's a fair sentence that you can come up with. At the fundamental core is that prosecutors are charged with being ministers of justice. And when presented with the right information, uh, should consider it. Uh, and should consider that in any plea offer or negotiation. All right, so now it's the day of sentencing. I bet the person's sure looking forward to this day. Uh, anything you can do to do better at sentencing in terms of just how you present yourself? Oh, I think for our clients or a, a litigant, 
it's of course coming in and acknowledging responsibility. Uh, it's taking responsibility. It's coming up and looking at the court uh, and acknowledging what you're going to do to make right on the harm. Uh, and I think those two steps take you a long way. And of course, showing the stability that you have in your life in the future to make right on your promise. Uh, Judge DeSanto, any, can any event kind of come to mind where there was a sentencing where you thought somebody made a really good presentation that, that kind of affects, affected how you sentence somebody? Oh, yeah, definitely. There, there, are, there are quite a few cases that come to mind uh, without naming who the participants were. The things that were, were significant were there was family support. <coughs> there was uh, letters written uh, by close uh, re relationships, uh, by people with close relationship with the defendant in their behalf, telling me the good about uh, the person. Uh, there was uh, no uh, new offenses committed between conviction and sentencing, which is often weeks and sometimes even months between the two. Uh, the, the converse, of course, is commit a crime between those two and you're not going to do so well at sentencing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Let's talk a little bit about DWI because I know there's been some changes going on and there's a Supreme Court case and all these other things. So first of all, would one of you like to comment on, generally speaking, DWI sentencing? What's new there in terms um, of the criminality? Well, the, one of the big changes that happened uh, just this summer, this past summer, is with DWIs, it's an aggravated offense. So it, it steps up every time you get a new DWI. And one of the big changes is one of the step ups used to be that if you were at a .20, that was an enhanceable, that was an enhanceability factor. Now it got lowered to a .16. So if you're double the legal limit, you're automatically stepping up one more level for your your DWI. And that was a huge that's a huge jump, and it's including a lot more people now in that bumped up category. So maybe that's two martinis in an hour or something, huh? Depends on who you are. <laughs> I don't, I mean, you know, somebody weighs 150 pounds, it, it isn't uh, necessarily a night uh, of drinking or something, huh? Right. Wow. And so what does that mean when you get this enhanced DWI, you know, double, triple probation, you know? Um, well, the first one that you get is a misdemeanor. Um, and if you, there's different factors. There's the .16 now, which can bump you up to a gross misdemeanor. If you have a kid in the car, that'll bump you up to a gross misdemeanor. Or if you have a prior one, that'll bump you up to a gross misdemeanor. And does that mean you go to jail for sure then? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you have more jail time hanging over your head with each step up. Um, and at some point, you are going to be starting to serve jail time. A lot of it's going to be stayed while you're on probation, though. But you're looking at more exposure to jail time the further down that line you go. Do, do people ever get a uh, jail time for a first time DWI at say a .09 where nobody gets hurt or anything like that and they, they don't flee the scene or you know, do anything terrible like that? Um, well, they usually get put in jail for probably about 12 hours or so is kind of what the misdemeanor one ends up being. But after that, unless they're violating probation or something, they're not gonna be seeing themselves in jail again. That's just sort of the night of the <laughs> event then? Yes. Okay. And, and so if somebody gets stopped for DWI, do they have to spend the night in jail or can somebody come get them? Um, it's kind of up to the officers. So, so if you're very polite, <laughs> yeah, you might have a fighting chance? You always have a better chance at anything you want if you're polite. You didn't want to have the officer have a fight with their spouse that night then, uh, <laughs> earlier? Okay. It's often difficult to be polite when you're intoxicated too. Yeah, now what's this constitutional thing about DWI? What's going on? Uh, what's happening is DWI law remains really unsettled for the past number of years. There is a Supreme Court case, uh, a case that's going to reach the United States Supreme Court, we believe on April 20th, uh, called Bernard. Uh, and it fundamentally is asking the question, uh, is the breath test constitutional without a warrant? Uh, and the United States Supreme Court will be deciding that. Uh, what's happening in Minnesota appellate courts is that uh, there are Minnesota appellate courts that have brought into question whether 
taking someone's breath, uh, blood, I'm sorry, is constitutional without a warrant, and whether taking someone's urine uh, is constitutional without a warrant. So I think there's, uh, the state of the law is really unsettled right now uh, for both uh, the motorist, law enforcement, courts, uh, and the system as a whole. Vicki, is it a crime to not take a test if you get stopped for DWI? Yes. Okay, so that's a cr crime too. It's still a crime. Um, we'll see what happens after the Supreme Court rules on this, but right now it's still a crime to refuse the test. Okay. Let me move on to a little different topic here because we had an a, interesting question. How often do children get tried as adults? Who wants to take that one? Well, I can tell you that uh, there is a process in Minnesota <coughs> for certifying children uh, to be tried as adults. It still remains rare. It's designed really for the most serious of cases, uh, cases where the guidelines presume a prison sentence, so the most serious of ass assaultive felonies, a death case. Uh, but as a general rule, Minnesota has had a long history of keeping children in the juvenile delinquency system and to not try children as adults. I think we, moreover, the United States Supreme Court has talked extensively about how children are not adults uh, and has ruled extensively that it's unconstitutional to uh, place chill children on a death penalty track uh, to take mentally retarded children and attempt to try them as adults. So I think the state of the law really is trending to bring keep children where they should be, where we could treat children, find better ways than just locking them up into an adult system. Vicki, well, oh, go ahead. Vicki, tell me a, a situation where you have pushed for a 17 or a 16 or 8-year-old uh, child to be uh, prosecuted as an adult. Have you had any of those? I, I have not. Um, I've been with the office for a little over three years, and I'm, I, right now off the top of my head, I can only think of one case where a, a juvenile was tried as an adult, um, and it was for a, a murder. So, and I, I think he may have been 17 at the time. And I was going to say that uh, with, with all due respect to everything Dan said, which is accurate, uh, if you are 16 or 17, and an adult being the 18-year-old, uh, and you have committed a serious crime, uh, there are some pr uh, factors that presume or give the prosecution some presumptions in favor of certifying them for adult prosecution. Okay. Here's another area uh, that we got a question. Are there any restorative justice programs in Duluth? First of all, what's restorative justice, Dan? Restorative justice is a concept where we bring the person who is offended along with members of the community, as well as the person who's been harmed, tr traditionally called the victim, and we collectively, as a community, find a solution. It's designed to repair the harm and to have folks meet each other. Maybe not just in the courtroom, but in the community setting. So it's a really an innovative approach and we do have restorative justice programs. Menace Peacemakers uh, is really a leader in the community in uh, restorative justice programs and working with juveniles, uh, working with men, and mostly men involved in domestic violence cases, uh, as well as broader context. You know, we've referred many positive cases to uh, sen sentencing circles uh, and so those are some really, some really innovative things that we're doing in the community. Do you like that? Yeah, actually, um, some people refer to restorative justice as, as hippie justice. Um, but it's actually, I, I was part of a restorative justice circle when I was in law school, and it was awesome. It totally changed my view on a lot of things. Um, and it was, it was just the interaction between my role and a defendant's role and a victim's role and a judge's role and all brought together is it's actually very cool and I got it a great works question in some here. circumstances. Okay, very good. We're going to move on again. Got a great question. Someone kicks in your door in the middle of the night. It appears they have a weapon. You shoot them and they call the, and call the police. 
What should you tell the police? What should you not say? Tell them the truth. Tell them, absolutely, tell them the truth. He busted my door down. I see a weapon. Uh, it's in my home. I can, I can, I've responded with deadly force, which I believe is, I mean, this isn't how you say it to the police, but uh, the, give him the facts. Give the law enforcement officer the facts. Having said that, I'm sure Dan here, as a good and uh, knowledgeable criminal defense lawyer, may be saying, don't say anything. It's a real delicate balance. Uh, of course, no one has to speak to law enforcement. Uh, it's guaranteed to us by the Constitution. Yet, under those circumstances, uh, I think overthinking it may put you in a bad spot. What if it turns out it was a flashlight and it was the neighbor whose house was being burnt down and you didn't come to the door very quickly? I'm not understanding. You know, and, and so you did what? He knocked the door down to try and get his oh. neighbor to call the police or, what, or call the fire department or whatever. And he had a flashlight in his hand and the guy thought it was a gun. Yeah. That's a These very are difficult case. <laughs> These are going to be difficult circumstances. Very difficult circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Call the lawyer I guess, yes. right away. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is somebody from Duluth, they've got a question, and they said um, the charge was changed to fifth degree possession of a controlled substance, and somebody took an Alfred plea with total expungement. A lawyer wants extra money to do the expungement. Is this something uh, he can do on his own? So I, I guess it starts out with somebody pleading to fifth degree. Sure. Um, possession of controlled yeah. substance. So what would that be like? A bag of marijuana? Possibly. It's a low it level could be. drug. Yeah. It okay. could be trace trace amounts of one of the many controlled su substances. Okay. And then the Alfred plea is what? Basically, uh, there's enough evidence to convict me. I acknowledge that, but um, because of that, but I'm innocent. But I'll I'll acknowledge that on these reports, on these facts, there's enough evidence to convict me. Now, some states don't allow that? Uh, I think most states most allow states the Alfred plea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. they do. In, in Wisconsin, it would be the, the equivalent of a no contest plea. All right. And then, so this, this guy you know, didn't think he was yeah. guilty, but he pled guilty, and now he wants it expunged. Oh. Uh, can they do that on their own, Vicki? Yes. There's, um, there's a lot of, lot of self-help um, areas, like, for instance, in the law library in the courtroom, in the courthouse, there's a volunteer attorney in that library who can help you find those papers that you need to fill out and you can fill the forms out yourself if you want. Uh, is it how frequently that, is Let me allowed? add this to that, that uh, scenario. As a judge, I've had uh, quite a few expungement uh, cases before me. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, it's an area of the law I have a, a, a real strong interest in because there's some new uh, uh, statutes that now allow it more, more, more liberally as well, the expungement. The fact, that I, I just went one recently in front of me in another part of the state where the, uh, there was, had been an Alford plea to a crim sex conduct third degree and a stay of adjudication. He'd completed all uh, of the uh, treatment, et cetera, successful on probation. The fact that there was the Alford plea was in my, th to my way of thinking, a mitigating factor because the prosecutor allowed it even though there's a claim of innocence, and it couldn't have been as serious as if it hadn't been offered. Uh, it was an ingredient in my decision making. So does the expungement take it off the books then completely? It seals the record seals for anyone. The record. Here's the, the, the difficulty with that. Sometimes it just seals the court records, not the law enforcement or the other uh, branches of government's records, the BCA, et cetera. If you get it all sealed, completely sealed, that's the best benefit, but it isn't always the case. So let's say you had a, some kind of a thing involving a, a, a crime for which you lose your right to bear firearms, okay? Would an expungement work? No, it would not. It, wouldn't, it would seal the public record, but to, to regain your rights to possess firearms is very difficult. Under state law, there's a very limited provision where you can petition the court and a judge would have the discretion to restore your firearms rights. They're pretty rare. In my 20 years of practice, I recall one. Uh, 
there are certain offenses while you may have your firearms rights restored in state court, you still would have a federal firearms ban. So it's a very tricky area of the law. It's not something that we can take care of in a few sound bites here. You need to talk to someone and think this through. Which goes back to that original question about is it okay for a lawyer to charge me to, to uh, now do get my record expunged? Absolutely, there's a lot of work involved in that, in doing it right. You can do it on the paper forms without a lawyer, but if you want a lawyer to, uh, to do it right, um, you have to understand there's gonna be a fee involved. It'd be extra than just doing the criminal defense yeah, usually. Absolutely. Okay. What are the repercussions if someone lies in a discovery deposition in a civil case, before trial, what happens if they're caught in the lie? Well, that's about every 20 seconds. <laughs> um, they're, they're all in prison now, right, Judge? <laughs> all those that lied? Yeah, uh, yeah. hardly. <laughs> uh, so your question, your specific question yeah, is? So somebody uh, lies in their deposition, which is under oath, and then they get caught <clears throat> lying, okay, in a civil case. Have you, have you ever seen one prosecuted? Uh, I've been in, in the courts for over 43 years. I remember one. I <laughs> okay. remember one as a prosecutor, right. and a jury laughed me out of the courtroom. Oh, you prosecuted I it? I prosecuted it. Okay. They kind of in expected it? In fact, it was it? before the Honorable <laughs> Judge Charles Barnes, if he's watching tonight. Uh, it's good to see a judge on, through this TV screen. Uh, and he said, why are you prosecuting this? <laughs> <laughs> Who was the defense lawyer? I don't remember. Right. I honestly okay. don't. Um, Okay, that was another expungement question. Okay, here's another question. Um, body camps, real hot topic. We got about five minutes left here. Let's throw this around for a moment anyway. Um, what do you think of it in terms of a prosecutor? Is that something you like to have or don't like to have? Well, body camps are a pretty powerful tool with lots of pros and cons. Um, it's good in the fact that, I mean, if you're going to prosecute a domestic and you, got the, you can see the victim <clears throat> right after it happened and, and what she just went through, well, he too, but what she just went through and, and all the emotions that are happening. And that's something that you can't describe. And, and seeing that is, is such a powerful thing. The cons are, um, in society these days, everyone wants to see videos and pictures. And if they don't see it, it didn't happen. And the reality is crimes have been happening long before technology. And just because it's not caught on a body cam doesn't mean it didn't happen. And, and I think that's what people expect these days. Did you notice that as a prosecutor through the years that more and more the juries were watching CSI and all that and they were expecting like, you're gonna pull this rabbit out of a hat with the, a bunch of music in the background and some fabulous evidence uh, on video or whatever? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah there's more expectations yeah. uh, to the detriment uh, of, of actually just taking the case as it exists in the courtroom. But body cams also change behavior, changes behavior for folks wearing them and I believe it changes <laughs> behavior folks who are on the other side of the cameras. Uh, it, ins it ensures pu public trust. And at the end of the day, uh, it's why I support body cams. You know, one thing, uh, another plus, if you will, for body cams is the, cam the, the camera can only show what's visible to the camera. There's no biases involved. There's no prejudice involved. It is what it is. Having said that, it's all about angles in which it was viewed, and uh, it, I mean, it's, in a sense, it's better than eyewitness testimony, but is it the solution? I don't know that it's the absolute solution. It's not God watching, is it? Right, huh? right. Yeah. Um, how about as a mechanism to uh, reduce racism in uh, law enforcement? I think body cams really help that discussion. More and more, citizens are concerned about how they're treated in the street. It's now not one person's word against the other. It's captured on three or four or five or six different angles on body cams. And it shows what it shows. 
One, one last little topic, because we got about 30 seconds. Um, cell phones, searching cell phones. Uh, anything to add on that uh, for what's been on the front page of the newspaper for the last three weeks? You need a warrant. You know, it's like, it's, it's your computer. Search you uh, Cell phones are now, as the case law says, they're mini computers, they're your computer. You need a search warrant, which means you have to have probable cause to believe they contain something that's evidence of a crime. Have you gotten people's uh, cell phones before, Vicki? Yes, um, cell phones are gold mines when it comes to information. It's unbelievable what you can get on a cell phone these days, and it can be so helpful to any sort of case. We've got to go here. Uh, so that's all the time we have. And I want to thank you three. You did a great job tonight for sharing your knowledge and so forth. And uh, I didn't ask you uh, about the uh, Congan murder trial. We didn't have six hours and 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> uh, watch the show again uh -huh. uh, online if you'd like at www.wdse.org or on the Falsani, Bomber, Peterson, Quinn, and Byer website. Please join us again next week when we answer your questions about legal ethics. I'm Bob Falsani. Good night. Thank you.